Okay, Don. Okay. Mr. Ambassador, how are you this afternoon? Uh, very good afternoon to all of you. Thank you for having me today. Well, thank you. Uh, Rockford University uh, is honored to uh, have you with us today. A very brief introduction. Um, uh, Sheikh Abdullah bin Rashid Al Khalifa uh, is the ambassador from Bahrain uh, to the United States, Mexico, Canada, and Argentina. Uh, he was educated in the United States. We'll talk about that shortly. Uh, he is a fighter pilot, flew F-5s and uh, F-16s, and um, uh, is a very fascinating and interesting person. And Mr. Ambassador, we are just thrilled that you could be with us this afternoon. Chairman, it's such a pleasure to be with you today. Uh, I've been anticipating this, uh, this whole week, and I uh, look forward to the conversation uh, I always find a reason to uh, reach out to folks beyond Washington, and this is a prime example. So thank you for having me. Well, we appreciate that. Let me, let me ask you a question here. Uh, you're ambassador to multiple countries. Uh, tell us how you can wear all these different hats at the same time uh, and divide and keep up on all the issues with four countries, plus uh, your country, of course. Well, I, 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 I do not have a, a straight answer to, to, the, to the question, um, any question related to time, uh, because to me it's, it's all a blur. But um, uh, I think that uh, primarily it's, it's due to my involvement with many government and non-government entities before uh, coming to Washington. That had um, uh, helped me or assisted me in uh, trying to uh, pick up a lot of different issues and deal with them simultaneously. So uh, I think there are two ways of looking at it. The first would be to look at it from a professional perspective. And uh, like you clearly stated, Chairman, uh, not only am I representing my country here in, uh, in Washington, but also Canada, Mexico, and Argentina. Uh, within this specific area, as you're quite aware, bilateral relations between nations are typically political, economic, and cultural in nature. And the level at which each relationship is defined is usually based on common interests. And so all countries tend to prioritize these relations based upon the need and the depth of the collection of issues that form the bilateral relations. Since those issues between the United States and Bahrain are the deepest, the oldest, and most impactful, not only upon us, but the entire region. I tend to spend most of my time here in Washington. Uh, and looking at the United States, I have to consider that different geographies have different means, motives, and priorities. Um, and not to oversimplify it, but merely acknowledging the difference between the Beltway and the rest of the United States demonstrates the need for differences in handling various parties that I engage with uh, on a daily basis. Uh, although I spent most of my time here in Washington, I jump on any opportunity to engage with Americans throughout the rest of the country, uh, whether it's corporations or chambers, uh, committees, uh, universities and colleges like we do here. Um, it's all made easier by the advent of Zoom, which uh, <laughs> is a silver lining uh, of all the all what's happening in the pandemic. But uh, when it comes to this relationship, Bahrain cares deeply about uh, this one and others as well. So for, for the three countries within my purview, uh, I'm fortunate to have a team, a team of skilled diplomats. And however, diplomacy cannot be left solely to emails, telephone calls and, and support personnel. That's why uh, every once in a while, I'll very quickly visit those countries, um, do the necessary work to keep the momentum going. On a personal note though, uh, which was the second half of the answer, I'm a father of five, uh, the oldest being 15, and the youngest of which are three four-year-old boys. So if you thought that the first half of the plate was full, 
then <laughs> this side sometimes nearly breaks the plate into pieces. Um, but uh, the strategy that has worked for me so far is prioritize, sacrifice, and learn to apologize a lot. <laughs> uh, coming from the father of triplets. <laughs> wow. The, um, Ron, did you have the next question of the ambassador? Mr. Ambassador, this is uh, Ron Lee, and I'm co-teaching this course at Rockford University with uh, Don Manzullo. It's really an honor to have you here today and to, for you to take some time out of your busy day uh, to be with us. Um, we know that you stu spent a number of years studying, um, uh, getting your education in the United States, a, a bachelor's and an MBA from Bentley University in, in Massachusetts. Um, and also a certificate from Harvard's Kennedy School of Government focusing on innovation and governance um, as part of your uh, executive education program. Can you talk about what you learned about Americans from this experience of studying in the United States? Well, thank you, Professor Lee. Uh, let me take a, a step back to uh, my final years in high school in Bahrain. And I think what, uh, what made the transition easier was that it was an American high school diploma that I got. Um, I took the SATs, uh, I took what's called the TOEFL, uh, and it, it just was a breeze when it came to freshman year in college. Uh, um, the education that I was granted by my professors were, were, was great. Um, but the opportunity to live in the United States for six years has most, most definitely left an impact on myself. Uh, I mean, uh, only yesterday I was speaking to a former secretary who, who's from Boston, and we agreed not to utter a single word related to the Red Sox given their performance in the previous <laughs> season. Now, I, I, I do realize that I might be speaking to Cubs fans and that even puts me in a, in, a, in a more awkward position, so I want to move quickly to uh, bridging it to, to, to another point. But um, definitely the experience that I have received in the United States for six years was phenomenal. Um, in class, out of class, it was just uh, as important to, to, um, to immerse myself in, uh, in the culture, very rich culture, uh, and build uh, friendships and relationships that I still have today. It's it's very unusual uh, for ambassadors to the United States to have such a background uh, in the United States that even to have a favorite baseball team. So we uh, were we're we're quite we're quite impressed with that. Um, we have a we have a question just and two more questions that are going to take obviously a little bit longer period of time and that is. The name of our course is Current Events in U.S. Foreign Policy. And uh, our students have been studying foreign policy from different angles. And, and the angle that we are very much interested in is, is uh, how is U.S. foreign policy perceived uh, from abroad? In other words, how does the world look upon U.S. foreign policy? Very broad question, and, and go ahead and take your liberty in answering it. It's up to you. Uh, that is a, a great question, Chairman. And I think it really depends on who's answering the question. Um, if, if I was to take a 60, 70 year old Bahraini uh, and ask him this question, he's probably going to say McDonald's, Cadillacs, John Wayne probably because of the searchers or Rio Bravo, but let's not forget World War II, um, even though it ended in, in, in 1945, Bahrainis remember when we were hit by the Italians in an effort to strike British interests in the, in the Middle East. And given the US's role with the allies, Bahrain always saw the United States as a friend. And so uh, you, you might, you talk about other elements that might come to mind um, that best describe the U.S. from a foreign perspective. I would say it's, it's life, liberty, freedom, the strength of the Constitution, the American dreams. Um, but if we were to ask 
uh, if I was to ask my, my daughters the same question, uh, uh, forget about it. I mean, uh, as, as many of you are, are very, very well know that kids nowadays, they listen to the same music, they play the same games, and it seems like there's more synergy between communities than ever before. And as a whole, regardless of whether we're talking about the older generations of Bahrainis or people my age or my kids, uh, we all share the commonality of a very positive and warm feelings towards both America as a whole and more specifically the American people. Um, ever since the first Americans set foot in Bahrain over a century ago, with the intention of introducing Christianity, Bahrain has opened oh, and, and openly embraced them and their teachings. Uh, today, we uh, publicly engage with and celebrate our relationship with Americans' culture and uh, their appreciation for religious freedom as well. But in addition to those uh, feel-good concepts in which our people align, We've also been uh, the first to stand with the United States in security and, and, and military actions throughout the region. Whether it is the, the direct war on terror or the battle against extremism, Bahrain has always been there. Ultimately, we consider the US our most important ally outside the region. Uh, likewise, the U.S. views us as a major non-NATO ally, and over many decades, Bahrain has stood shoulder to shoulder alongside the United States in every major operation in the region, including the first Gulf War, Operation Desert Storm, and, and Operation Heritage Resolve. Um, not only that, but Bahrain plays host for the U.S. Navy's fifth fleet since 1948. Uh, the same facility uh, hosts CENTCOM, it, it hosts uh, the, what's called the International Maritime Security Construct. Uh, and so the defense component of the relationship has always been strong. The people-to-people -people relationship was established a very long time ago. It still is a, uh, an important component within uh, the, the bilateral relations that we have. And uh, to top it off, the trade relations are also very important. Uh, Bahrain is one of only two countries in the GCC that has a free trade agreement with the United States. That has uh, assisted in doubling our exports to the US. The US has been able to triple its exports into Bahrain over the last uh, decade. And so I think that uh, the, the our role here in Washington is clearly defined. Uh, we are looking at ways in further strengthening those relationships. And uh, we're grateful that uh, it's, it's moving from one place to, to, to another. The, uh, let, me, let me ask a follow-up on that. How, how closely do people in, in Bahrain follow uh, events taking place across the world? I think with the, with the internet, uh, Jim, it has become uh, easier to follow a lot of what's going on throughout the world. But uh, it seems increasingly important to look at even uh, the US, uh, US domestic politics. Uh, the U.S. has a lot of influence in the region. Um, policy shifts occur whenever there are new administrations, and um, there there might be results that will that we will see in the region. And so, um, a lot of people will will follow it, uh, and I'm talking mostly government officials. Uh, but at the end of the day. I think that um, because of just the way in which people live their lives today with technology, with, uh, uh, with the internet, with interactions between one another, with the ease of traveling as well, uh, there has been a, an easier way uh, 
to get information. Uh, sometimes we overload ourselves with information and it becomes harder to find um, sources that are reliable because of so many options out there. Uh, but uh, people do follow uh, news. They, they, we have one of the highest literacy rates. We have one of the highest internet usage rates in the region. And so um, it, it doesn't come as a surprise to me that uh, people will look into uh, a lot of issues, um, including the stock market, including um, areas that we have collaborated on for, for many years and see how some of the policies might affect those uh, relationships. But I, I want you to know that when I was in Congress, I voted for uh, the U.S. Uh, Bahrainian Free Trade Agreement. Uh, it was a very interesting discussion uh, in Congress, but a very easy vote. And um, it, it's proved uh, quite substantial for, for both countries. Um, Ron, did you have another follow-up question on this issue, or did you want to go to the fourth question? Let me just add one point, uh, Chairman. I think uh, I, I I really appreciate uh, your comments, sir. Uh, coming from the dawn of manufacturing, uh, <laughs> the, the FTA was was really a way in which both countries can can maximize their trade benefits. Um, take, for example, aluminum. Uh, most of the aluminum product that's being exported to the U.S. Uh, is is being um, delivered to a downstream industry here in the U.S. as opposed to it being done in Bahrain. So it creates jobs here, it creates jobs back in Bahrain, and it's a win-win situation. Uh, we've tried to make sure that all our relationships, whether they are trade-related or even in, on, on the defense side, um, that we're always looking out for the greater good of both countries and not being selfish in, in, in any way. So uh, it has worked and uh, we, uh, we thank you for your support and we look forward to uh, uh, forging a new chapter with the United States when it comes to uh, further trade dealings between the two countries, specifically in the fields of uh, FinTech technology, AI, uh, the, the sky's the limit to how much work can be done between the two countries. Um, we sometimes overlook the size, because of the size of the of, of Bahrain, the geographic location is very important, but it has also proven to be a, a, an environment where a lot of companies would like to test their products. And because of the size of the market, uh, we can do that. So. Uh, sometimes we do get interest, uh, whether it's from the U.S. or Europe, but it has proven to be beneficial for those that work with us, and we look forward to uh, more. Good. Ron? Mr. Yep. Mr. Ambassador, Bahrain seems to be in the midst of a lot of changes in the Middle East right now concerning Israel and the, the broader region. Um, we wonder if you could comment on what's happening, what you see is at stake, and where you see all of this going? Uh, I think we're referring to the to the Abraham Accord um, that was announced uh, two weeks ago. And uh, for those familiar with Bahrain, they uh, obviously did not uh, see it as a surprise. Uh, we had for many years been working on uh, the issue of peaceful coexistence and tolerance between um, uh, not only in Bahrain, but in the region as a whole. And uh, here we were at a historic moment um, that uh, was, uh, was created by our strongest ally outside of the region. Uh, the United States played an integral role in pulling this together. And the UAE were uh, the first to announce. Bahrain very quickly followed. And uh, we believe that it is an important pillar for the stability of the region. Um, peace basically allows people to understand one another, to learn from each other. 
and to live in harmony. Uh, it is aligned with the country's national in initiative in encouraging peaceful coexistence uh, through regional through religious tolerance. But it also unlocks huge opportunities for our nations in the region. Uh, as we speak today, actually, um, we have working committees back home that are creating a framework by which we will collaborate on identifying and implementing shared initiatives between uh, the two parties. Um, we are trying to instill hope in the region, uh, especially for uh, those that have been living in different areas uh, within the Middle East that um, uh, for the kids, they haven't gone to school for 10 years. And they are looking at ways in which uh, there could be change introduced into their lives. And so, uh, yes, the Palestinian-Israeli issue was an issue that was, uh, that has always been a nonpartisan issue. It has always been an important issue here in Washington and in the Middle East. But also the Arab-Israeli issue was one that uh, we grew up with. Um, it was one that uh, we uh, thought would be resolved. And we're starting to see countries move in a direction to make it uh, easier for others to follow. So uh, it was a, a, a bold decision. Uh, we understand that there might be ramifications to the decision, both internally and regionally. But when we looked at the benefits, the benefits obviously out, outweighed uh, those concerns and we moved forward with this historic decision. So the, the agreement uh, initially starts with the recognition of each country. And then what, what follows from there in the, uh, in the Abrahamic Accords? So, uh, there were, included in it? There were two agreements that were signed on, on uh, September 11th of 2020. The first one being the uh, declaration of peace between Bahrain and Israel. Uh, that was witnessed by the President of the United States. And he was the third signature on that agreement. Uh, or actually, I, I shouldn't call it an agreement because it was an announcement. Um, and what happens here is we have agreed to formally recognize one another. Uh, what we're doing as we speak today is looking at areas in which we will be working with one another. So uh, we'll, we will definitely start with uh, visas, uh, financial institutions working with one another, uh, uh, travel, uh, flights to and from uh, each country, uh, and uh, the establishment of full diplomatic ties, meaning we'll have an ambassador in Israel, we'll have an Israeli ambassador in Bahrain. Uh, but there are so many other aspects of the relationship that could be taken forward. Uh, there's a lot of technology that uh, the Israelis have been working on for a long period of time that we're interested in. There are markets within Bahrain that the Israelis are in interested in. And so uh, I think with the development of the four working groups within the government of Bahrain, uh, we will be activating that relationship and will hopefully uh, show some results in the very near future uh, as as things unfold. The other agree. The other uh, 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 document that was signed was the Abraham Accords. Now, uh, on that agree on that uh, uh, announcement. Um, it was the three countries that signed, but it's always open for others to join. And there were uh, principles of uh, the, uh, the, the, the accords that were very much in line with um, countries promoting peaceful coexistence, countries promoting 
tolerance to different uh, religions. And it is completely in line with what we call the Bahrain Declaration that was put forth back in 2017, um, which has more or less the same principles. And so uh, I think this was an opportunity for Bahrain. Uh, this was an opportunity for the region. And uh, we're very hopeful that not only will those be uh, agreements that are signed, but will actually have our people's benefit out of them directly, as opposed to uh, just announcements and, and then with time people forget. What, what Mr. Ambassador, are you, are you expecting other countries to join? It seems like there is an expectation that other countries will join. Uh, there are a lot of talks here in Washington about a, a number of countries that might be moving in the same direction. Um, but uh, I, I just think that uh, the ball has started moving and uh, we're very hopeful of uh, the future of the, of, of the Middle East, the future of the relationship that we have uh, initiated with the State of Israel. What, what does this mean, uh, the Abrahamic Accords, what does this mean to the Middle East as a whole, and also as an example of cooperation to the world as a whole? When we look at uh, conflicts within the Middle East, let's take, for example, Syria or Yemen. Uh, those conflicts have been going on for a period of time now. Uh, whereas you have the Israeli-Palestinian conflict that's, that's much older in age, which created the Israeli-Arab uh, conflict. Now what we're seeing is that uh, countries like Bahrain still address the uh, Israeli-Palestinian issue. When our foreign minister was in Washington, he clearly stated that Bahrain is still up for the two-state solution. Bahrain is still up for the Arab Peace Initiative. But at the same time, that doesn't rule out the possibility of Bahrain and Israel having uh, direct relationships with one another. And so uh, that is a new dynamic. The UAE obviously uh, moved in the same direction and, and Bahrain uh, move followed by, I'd say, a, a, a couple of weeks. But um, when we say that it instills hope in the region, we mean that uh, seeing old conflicts starting to melt down and resolve um, creates or sets a different narrative in the region. And that's what we're hoping for. We are hoping that within a year or two, when when people see the uh, positive coming out of the establishment of that relationship, uh, they might be more inclined to move in the same direction, uh, to be open, uh, to be open like Bahrain, to be tolerant like Bahrain, uh, and, and hopefully uh, uh, push back on any attempt to uh, push people to extremes. Uh, the issue of uh, terrorism and radicalization has always been uh, an issue that was addressed in Bahrain and the region. Um, it's, it's one of the reasons uh, why we have adopted uh, this approach to, to uh, the openness in Bahrain. Uh, and uh, with more and more countries communicating with one another, we're hopeful that uh, uh, we start to see uh, less interference and extremism uh, in, in our part of the world. And that will have a direct effect, not only on the region, but also uh, other parts of the world. Well, the uh, <clears throat> uh, Bahrain has less than 2 million people. Um, it's made quite a, a mark 
on the world and a tremendous step towards peace in the region. So the people in, in the United States are, are quite excited uh, over, over what's just happened in the past 30 days and over the possibilities. Uh, I've got one final question, and then I know you're running out of time. Do you still fly? <laughs> as a pilot <laughs> I, I, I have to um, uh, I, I have to apologize and, and uh, uh, correct you chairman on, on that final uh, question because my predecessor had the first had that same uh, first and last name he was the fighter pilot I was the governor uh, so I spent the past seven years in Bahrain as a governor I, I did not fly the F-16s uh, he did, but uh, uh, there's always that uh, confusion. I've been here for three years. It's been a, a, a lovely three years. Uh, we are, I could say, at an all-time high when it comes to the relationship between the two countries. And uh, we hope to, uh, to forge a stronger relationship in the years to come as well. Well, I, I'm sorry I got, that, uh, I got that confused in your introduction. Uh, Rockford University has been the home to uh, several ambassadors who have been visited in the past several years, two ambassadors from Japan, uh, ambassador from uh, South Korea, the ambassador from Thailand. We know that you travel extensively uh, the United States during normal times when we're not in the middle of this virus. And I just want you to know that, that you have an open invitation uh, to visit us at Rockford University um, and, and to bring along your chief of staff. I have to uh, introduce Thomas Bezos. Uh, Thomas uh, worked, uh, he worked for me in the small business committee and my personal office did an outstanding job on the area of trade, international relations, and, and uh, I traveled extensively with him uh, through many places in the world. And again, we want to thank you for being very generous in your time and um, consider that to be an open invitation. Ron, did you have a closing? Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. No, thank, thank you, you. Uh, Chairman. Thank you, Professor Lee, for the opportunity. Uh, I do look forward to seeing you in person. Like I said, uh, d diplomacy can't be done through uh, those means, but we also are grateful that we can connect with one another. And I do look forward to seeing uh, Rockford and, and, and the students there as well. So uh, thank you for having me and uh, uh, you have a good day. Thank you, you thank too. You.